Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our listeners wherever you are on the planet. This is World Smart, a podcast of the Aaron Fox Law Firm. We are your hosts and Aaron Fox International Practice Group co-chairs. I'm Hunter Carter. And I'm Malcolm McNeil, and we'll be talking with partners, other lawyers, special guests about topics of interest in the law of international business and international business. Malcolm, today we have with us two really very special guests who are leaders, especially in the Americas, in the global discussion about anti-corruption. First of all, Dr. Jose Ugas from Lima, Peru, is with us. He is a lawyer in private practice with a storied career, including time as president of Transparency International. We also have with us from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Walfrido Vargi. Walfrido is a lawyer in private practice and an author of many books, including most recently a book entitled The Spectacle of Corruption. And he is currently counsel to former president of Brazil, Juma Rousseff. Gentlemen, welcome. It's nice to have you both here with us today. Jose, let's start to get to know each of you just a little bit first. As I said, you are certainly Peru's top anti-corruption lawyer. You served as special counsel to the country in the case of former President Alberto Fujimori and his intelligence chief, Vladimiro Montesinos. And you wrote a book that reads like a movie, and in fact now is a movie, called Kaiga Quien Kaiga, or Let the Chips Fall Where They May, as well as president, as I said, of Transparency International. Tell us more about your work, and in particular, how have you come to be a leader in dealing with corruption? Well, actually, I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I have worked in that area of law forever since I went out of the university. I practiced at the judiciary and then at the prison, the woman's prison of Lima. And then I started working on the private sector. But suddenly, one of my former clients became a minister, Jaime Yoshiyama, who is now indicted within the network of Fujimori. And when he became a minister, he asked me to assume the defense of the Peruvian state in one very highlighted case of corruption because he remembered the conversations we had while we were waiting for him to present his statement before the judge or a prosecutor. We were always talking about corruption. So he said, now is your opportunity to put in practice all the things you told me. And that's how I started working as a special, as an ad hoc special state defense attorney in corruption cases. And then I also became professor of criminal law at the university. That put me on a lot of face in TV. I was a public face talking about, you know, all these notorious criminal cases that happened in in Peru. And suddenly that big crisis on the Fujimori's regime that everybody knew that was involved in very serious corrupt practices for almost a decade started. So the government started collapsing. And then I was invited by the Minister of Justice at that time, who was a friend of mine. He had been my professor at the university, but he was the last Minister of Justice of Fujimori. He was a good guy. I mean, he was not involved in uh, the corruption of the regime, and he was really scared. And he said, look, Fujimori has asked me to put in prison Montesinos. I have no idea how to do that because he was a specialized in administrative issues. He had no idea of criminal law. And he said, the only one I can rely on is you, so please help me. And I said, well, this is my opportunity to go after Montesinos. I had very clear the role that Montesino was playing against the country and against me. I had personal issues with him because he was all the time pursuing me on the defense of some important criminal and economical cases I had in Peru. So that's how it started. Well, I know you are very fortunate to have been recognized for your work and then to be chosen to play that role. And ever since then, you've continued to play that role, both as a defense attorney and uh, as a leader in uh, non-governmental organizations like Transparency International. And Walfredo, this is um, also something you have in common with Jose. You founded a non-governmental organization called the Institute for the Reform of State and Business Relations. And even though you're a lawyer who's written on other subjects, you've recently written about corruption. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to be working on the area of anti-corruption. 
Yes, sure. Uh, you know, I, I'm a litigator. I've been a litigator for 25 years now and within the helm of uh, corporate litigation mainly. And when Operation Car Wash came up in 2014, at the end of 2014, I had a privileged place to observe what a purely punitive corruption comeback would cause to Brazil. So that started to worry me. And I started to foresee many of the things that we have now just because we didn't have the structural tools to fight corruption and we were fighting corruption in a way that I understood very harmful to our economy, to our political system and in a way that would divide our people. And that's what happened. I, I foresaw that. I wrote about that. In 2015, I wrote a book about the consequences of the way we were fighting corruption in Brazil in our infrastructure mark. And then in 2018, I wrote another book saying what would be the economic and the political damage of not having certain types of regulation that would rationalize the fight against corruption. And I'd like to be more specific on that, just saying that we don't have a lobby legislation in Brazil. When you bring some very offensive tools to fight corruption without regulating lobbies, everything that the private sector does with the public sector may become criminal, may be understood as a crime. And more, the fight against corruption can be also used as lawfare, as an instrument of political group fight. And that's what happened in Brazil. And because of that, I created an institute to discuss these subjects and other subjects on Brazilian politics. And I've been doing that since 2016, besides my practice as a lawyer. That's very impressive, and I'm glad you brought up the subject of the tools used to fight corruption. Jose, you were a pioneer in the use of witness cooperation agreements, something that are very common in the United States, in my experience, uh, but which I think was quite new when you were the special prosecutor ad hoc. But tell me what's your opinion of the tools that are used to fight corruption. Have they been effective? Are they being effective? Are we using the right tools? And Malfredo, I'll ask you the same question in a moment. Well, I do agree with Walfredo that corruption is not going to be solved. Specifically, grand corruption is not going to be solved from the bench. And I think justice has its role. But it also has a relevant role in breaking impunity. And in countries like mine, I would say almost all Latin America, probably except Chile, Uruguay, maybe Costa Rica a little bit, corruption is systemic. And then we need to send strong messages about impunity because impunity has been the rule for all our history in this region. But the criminal system has not been at the same rhythm and involvement as corruption. And now we are talking about huge schemes of corruption. Lava Jato probably is the largest scheme of corruption I've seen in the region, and I don't know if in the world, 12 countries involved, huge companies and governments of all types. Just to say, five of our last presidents were linked to Lava Jato. Some of them are in prison. One took out his life. He committed suicide. The other one is spending extradition. And most of the results, the good results, we were able to obtain in the Fujimori case. The Fujimori case was a case I got, when I was in charge for the first 14 months, we opened criminal investigations against 1,400 people in more or less 250 criminal proceedings. 10% more or less of them went to prison. So nobody can say that it was a political persecution or it was an abusive system or lawfare to go against political opponents. It was clear, clearly a criminal network that seized power and were committing power and killing people from the government. So when we were trying to investigate this huge case with all these political personalities involved, we found that our tools were tools from a criminal procedural code of 1914. And they were designed to deal with, you know, little embezzlements and, and robberies and things like that, but not to deal with organized crime. So we decided to design several projects that we took to Congress. And, you know, because of the political crisis we were living at that time, Congress didn't oppose to these changes. 
and we were able to pass through the transitional government, the transitional minister of justice at that time, these new laws. And one of them was what we call here colaboración eficaz. That is kind of pre-agreement laws that had no tradition. In Latin America, there is no tradition of plea agreement. So this was totally new. And, you know, we had to fight strongly with that because people were saying, well, how are you going to arrive to deals with criminals? That, that is ethically not possible. That's not good. But then we demonstrated, and I think that since then up to now, La Colaboración Eficaz has demonstrated that it's a very, very efficient tool. It demonstrated when it was used intensively in the Italian manos limpias, mano pulite, clean hands process. And it has worked positively, I would say, in the Peruvian cases. Of course, there are mistakes. Of course, prosecutors and judges commit excesses. They are human beings. But I wouldn't say that in Peru there's been one case where prosecutors or judges have used these tools to go against politicians because of their ideology or their political stance. There are two, maybe three prosecutors or judges that have been highly questioned because, you know, they love to be in TV and public appearances and they speak too much. Probably they've seen too much movies, on, on American movies probably, and they want to be, you know, uh, key personalities in this debate. But in general, I would say, besides all the mistakes and excesses that have been committed along these 20 years of having Colaboración Eficaz, I would say that the balance is highly positive. So, Jose, I'm sorry, Wilfredo, let me turn it back to you now. You answered the same question that Jose was asked about the tools of corruption. He, he said only two or three judges have been seriously questioned in Peru, but Recently, a judge, a very important judge in Brazil was questioned, Sergio Moro. Why don't you tell us more about that? Yes, I think that we have to understand that the fight against corruption has four pillars. The first one, it is to define what is corruption. The second one is to detect corruption. It's important that the state has the right equipment to detect it. The third is enforcement. You may have good law saying what corruption is. You may have good detection mechanism, but you may have poor enforcement tools. So you need enforcement. Fourthly, you need a way out for a company. In Brazil, we still have a serious doubt if an official political campaign donations are acts of corruption or not. If you go to the United States, that uh, is a fairly solved question. You may have uh, moral issues against it, but not legal issues against it. So 80% of what happened in Lava Jato, or car wash operation, translating to English, was an official donation to political campaigns. Secondly, we gained, through a new legislation that came out on 2013, a lot of tools to detect corruption, some of them very similar to those mentioned by Jose. So we started to couple what we call preventive prison, or the fact that we could, in our legislation, arrest people for a short period of time to, in a certain way, make these people more willing to collaborate, willing to talk. And then we have a, a big issue. Is that moral? Is that legal? Is that covered by our constitution? Is that some kind of torture? And at the end, we didn't have a solution for companies. So we bankrupted many companies, important companies for the country. Sergio Moro was a leading character in this context because he was the main character of Lava Jato or Car Wash Operation because he was the judge. All the cases were solved by him. And suddenly he became the minister of justice of the main competitor of the party that was most damaged by Lava Jato. And that was the beginning of a political problem because people started to question if he had a political agenda before his actions as a judge. Afterwards, he fought with the president, with the current president, Bolsonaro. And because he was just saying that Bolsonaro didn't really want to fight corruption. But they became political enemies because Bolsonaro understood that he had a political agenda and wanted to become president of Brazil. So that's a very short description of what happened here. And all the problems we still have in fighting corruption in Brazil. 
Gentlemen, let me jump in. It's Malcolm here. I was fascinated by, I'm going to start with you, Jose, but the general question is how have your efforts over the past years changed perhaps public perception? Uh, Jose talked earlier about the possibility or the idea that corruption was systemic and that that tide is changing now because of legislation and other activities. I personally have been involved in the defense of certain municipal corruption cases uh, in California. And one of the things that the municipalities have had a problem with their resources. And something you said, Jose, caught my ear very loudly. And that was, you said that you had 1,400 criminal investigations that opened, leading to approximately 140 convictions. Did you have the resources? Did you have trouble putting together the resources to open as many investigations? And in other words, are there ample resources to do what you need to do? Well, the situation is that when we started to work on the Fujimori's case, and we had to open these 250 investigations with 1,400 indicted people or investigated people, we didn't even have an office because the government has collapsed. I was working from my private office, and my staff and my team was working from different parts, and we were not collecting nothing as a salary. We were just doing the work. When the transitional government arrived to power, that was like two weeks after we were appointed, then there was an amazing political will from one of the best presidents, if not the best presidents I've, I've known, that was Valentin Paniagua. The pity is that he was only in power for eight months. He was a transitional president. I resigned, of course, because I was appointed by Fujimori, by Fujimori's minister. So I resigned and he said, no, I know you. He was professor with me at the university. So he renewed my appointment. He gave us an office and he gave us a budget. We received around $1 million to do our work in the first 14 months. And uh, that was enough for what we needed to do here. So our resources were there and the political will that I believe is maybe more important than, than money in, in a case like this one was also there. So we were able to push very strongly and you have to understand that the attorney general's office had collapsed, the judiciary had collapsed, everything was in crisis here. That's why my office at that time became so relevant. People thought I was the attorney general of Peru and that was not true. I mean, I was only the state, the state attorney. But we, I don't know why, but Peru is very resilient, I would say. And, and I, I'm affirming this in the recent crisis we are having here with a pandemic, with a political situation. Peru is very resilient. So in quite a very short time, we had a new generation or appeared new faces of young judges, young prosecutors, new authorities that started doing their work in a very interesting and positive way. And that's why I believe it was possible to overturn the situation and start these investigations that I believe that one of the most positive outcomes of this process, this big process of, I don't know, it took like a decade Still, some of the cases are, are finishing right now after uh, 21 years. But I think that one of the most positive outcomes is that it returned to the population the sense that it was possible to believe in a change and to believe in an outcome of justice. And that, in a country like mine, is something very relevant. You were asking about the impact. I would say in the previous decades, before the Fujimori's case, when you ask the people in the polls which was the most relevant problem of Peru, they would say the lack of jobs, insecurity, too much criminality, or education. When the people was, were questioned and measured after the Fujimori's case, corruption came to the number one. And this is also because this was a unique case of corruption because everything was taped. Montesinos was a psycho and he was taping everything, all the bribes he paid, all the conversations he had, all these secret meetings, all of them were taped. And we had, we were very lucky because we seized one location and we found 80, 80 pieces of black luggage, Samsonite brand new black luggage full of videos. So people were watching videos, we were watching videos for almost three years, and still from time to time, a non-viewed video appears. And uh, so this is something that gave us also a lot of evidence for the cases, and it made it possible. It made it possible to convict a lot of people. 
Very interesting. Well, Frida, let me turn to you for a second because you have had a significant victory for the former president, Dilma Rousseff, who was cleared of corruption charges. And I'd like to ask you a little bit of the background on that. And I'd also like to ask you to explain a little bit the title of your book, Spectacle of Corruption. And then finally, what is the current feeling in Brazil regarding corruption, the public perception? Can it be cured? Is it still systemic? Are they resigned to corruption or is there a more optimistic view? Thank you. First of all, it's important to explain that President Dilma was never accused of corruption. We are talking about the acquisition of an oil refinery in Pasadena. On the time, Dilma was a member of Petrobras board, the board of Petrobras, our state oil company. And the accusation was that the whole board had lacked the duty of care when authorized the acquisition of Pasadena for a price that is superior to the market price or the price considered fair. And two things has to be considered. Dilma Rousseff is considered, even by her political opponents, a very honest person and a president that was very important, was a key character for Lava Jato operation. She provided all the instruments that were necessary for the federal prosecutors, the federal police and judiciary to investigate and punish corruption. And that is widely recognized. What the court found finally was that the board informed itself passively as it should be in a huge company. And the board was fooled. The board was simply betrayed by the executives who were themselves involved in corruption. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm very glad with uh, the final result of the judgment, not only because I'm the attorney responsible for the defense of former President Rousseff, but also because I personally believe that uh, justice was served. I wrote a book because I really think that corruption is an important thing in my country. And I really want corruption is treated in a structural manner in Brazil. We have to rationalize politics and politics financing in Brazil in order to avoid corruption, in order to make inequality in Brazil something that is not our main character, our main problem known by the whole world. And corruption is in the center of this problem. Corruption is the disease that causes inequality in Brazil because it is an instrument of competition and appropriation of wealth in this country. And my book was simply criticizing the way we fight corruption in Brazil, because we are not doing that in a systemic way. We are doing that in a case-by-case -case situation or fashion. And that is my problem, because now we will have a new period without a strong fight against corruption, and then a new scandal, and so on, and so on. And by doing that, we destroy the country, we divide the people, we destroy economy, and we don't really fight corruption. And that's my problem with it. Well, I think the title is excellent when you say the spectacle of corruption. You are right, Walfredo. Many people raise concerns about the use of law as warfare in politics. Lawfare, that term has come to be heard. I've heard you use that. And, you know, I was thinking of a Brazilian, Horacio Benedites, who was recently president of the International Bar Association, a very important figure. I heard him speak at a conference a couple of years ago, and he made Jose's point. And he said that now the biggest thing we talk about is anti-corruption, and the public is impatient that enough is not being done effectively to change corruption. That's a positive sign, and you each should be congratulated for doing your parts to make sure that a fair legal system, but one with effective tools, is addressing the issue, but doing so fairly and, and with justice. I have just one last uh, question for each of you. You've both played a significant role as public intellectuals, writing books, putting your story out there, speaking, doing public service, particular in, in NGOs. What is your personal motivation? Why go beyond your role as lawyer to a client to engage so actively in these conversations? Jose, let me ask you first and then Wilfredo. I believe it has to do with how I perceive my society and what do I want for my country to be. I have a family, I have a kids, and I had a possibility to study in a good school, in a good university, 
and to have some basic resources as a middle class, maybe high middle class. So I had no personal lacks in my youth, and I think I have to return. And it is terrible when you see that there's a bunch of people that are taking advantage of their power without taking into account the consequences of their acts. Because grand corruption and corruption in general has a negative, very negative impact in human rights. I mean, people die. We are now around 160,000 deaths in Peru because of the coronavirus. And I would say more than two thirds of these could have been avoided if we had enough oxygen plants. I mean, something so simple and that is not really expensive. People is dying here because they don't have oxygen. Three million people went back to extreme poverty after one month of confination when the, the emergency state was declared and people couldn't go out to the streets to work. And now most of those people don't have food to take to their mouths. We have something we call here popular kitchens, mm, cocinas populares. And that's what has saved the people because of solidarity among them. They get something to take to their families or to their mouths. So when you see that and suddenly you see a politician or an authority or an entrepreneur, a guy from the private sector, taking hundreds, I I will not say just millions, hundreds of millions or dozens of millions, and in some cases, billions of solace to their pockets without caring that people is dying, that people, you you know, it's, it's terrible seeing young kids now, poor kids that cannot go to school. They don't have access to smartphones. So they get together 2025 and get one smartphone from someone on the neighborhood. And then once they have a smartphone, they have to go to the hills to see if they can find an internet sign up to receive their classes. I mean, that is not uh, something I will accept ever. This is a strong and unacceptable violation of human rights. And nowadays corruption is in most of the cases, the main reason for this. And and we have to fight for a more equitable uh, society. Latin America is the worst region in the world regarding equity. So I think that's my personal motivation for this. That's a remarkable answer and it is proof of why you are so successful at this. Uh, Walfredo, how about you? What is your personal motivation? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Jose. It's the same. Is the same thing. I'm a lawyer, but the role of a lawyer is not just representing clients. I'm a human being. I'm a member of this the society. I'm a member of this community. And if you fight cor- corruption correctly, you will improve competition. You will ease inequality, and you end up with a country that is a better place to live for me, for my family, and for my fellow citizens. And that's my motto. That's my motivation. Exactly the same. I, would, I, I wouldn't I would put it in a better way than Jose. Exactly the same motivation. Let me ask one more question, gentlemen. I, I, I think we're getting to the end of our time and we don't want to keep you too long. But I was at a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act event where I was speaking, uh, and you're familiar with FCPA in the U.S., I trust. One of the speakers was talking about how the fight against corruption is a process, not an event. So that it has to constantly be something that is subject to vigilance. And I guess the next question for each of you, or the last question is, what's next? What's next in Peru to keep that process going? Well, what would make it more effective? And I would ask the same thing of you, Walfredo, in Brazil. Well, I would say it's a huge next because as, as Hunter said, on one side, there's much more clarity and consciousness about corruption and the negative impact of corruption. But at the same time, we have normalized in our culture that living day to day with corruption. So when you ask people what is a bribe, they say it's a payment for a service that I have received. I mean, what's that? People here has normalized corruption. We have made it more tropical, like saying, well, we are corrupt because we love ceviche and dance salsa, or because uh, we can dance bossa nova and eat feijoada. I mean, every country in the region has 
his own explanation why we have arrived to such levels of corruption. So I think that I do believe it is a process. I would say more, it's an accumulative process. I mean, what we did in 2000 is now in an accumulation process, what is happening now in the anti-corruption fight with the Lava Jato cases and the construction club and the corruption that have occurred during the pandemic acquisitions. But even though there's all these huge contradiction, people saying, well, we hate corruption and it's the main problem of the country, but we are part of it. I think we are going to receive more clarity in the next years. We have to prevent, we have we need new rules, for example, for political financement. I mean, in a country like mine, it is clear that financing of the political parties is coming from organized crime in many cases and corruption in other cases. So we, we need new rules. We need new political parties. We need a new policy for public acquisitions and so on. So we will have to confront in the future decades here. Thank you, Jose. Walfredo? I think that we have... Uh lots of instruments to punish corruption in Brazil. We have received FCPA rules. We have created new instruments to detect corruption. We are trying to improve a way out for companies, but we definitely, we are not touching the main point, how to prevent corruption. And the way to prevent corruption, it is to establish a rational regulation for public-private relationships. Uh, we don't have a proper campaign financing, a lobby statute. We don't have a lobbying regulation that is able to display in a transparent way who represents who. And more important, we don't have a lobbying regulation that forbids the organized crime to finance politics in Brazil. Actually, the lack of that regulation, it is a invitation for organized crime. And that is a big problem for our future. Well, in terms of what's next, uh, what's next is the conclusion of this wonderful conversation. It's too soon. I'd love for it to continue. Well, Frito, you were uh, the last person I saw on a foreign trip when I was in Sao Paulo at the beginning of the end of last February. And uh, Jose, I hope that we can all be together in person soon and, and perhaps continue this conversation. I can say from the American perspective that what's next on the FCPA, as Malcolm knows, is continued very aggressive activity by the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission against companies and against individuals in particular, where there's a much greater focus. But I do think there is a lot of good that has come from rewarding companies for having effective compliance plans that help to train their employees when they cannot make political contributions or payments to individual politicians or government officials in exchange for getting businesses or licenses that leaves much still to be dealt with, but uh, the world of international business is benefited, I think, greatly by the compliance regime or the world of compliance that we now have. Thank you both very much. Uh, you're good friends and you were good and generous with your time today to join us. We're very grateful. Thank you and we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, gentlemen.